Welcome. Um, welcome to the Rector's Forum at All Saints Church. Mi nombre es Mike Kenman. My name is Mike Kenman, soy rector. I am the rector. Pronombre el. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, it is a joy to have you here either in person, sort of filing in, uh, wherever you are streaming from around the world. Uh, it's great to have you here. Um, this is, we hope, our last forum in Sweetland Hall for a while. We actually have a working elevator now. It has passed inspection. There is much rejoicing. So after All Saints Day, we will be uh, back in the forum. And our next forum then, we'll be welcoming uh, Becca Stevens of Thistle Farms will be with us. So after the week after All Saints Day, Becca Stevens and some of the wonderful women of Thistle Farms will be returning to be with us. Um, just to remind you, uh, restrooms are a little bit of a sort of watership down rabbit warren from here. Uh, you can't go through that door because there's a class going in, so you have to go outside and around uh, on the door on your left into Regis House, uh, and there are restrooms for all genders uh, in there. Uh, if you're new at All Saints or visiting with us this morning, we have green contact sheet, sheet green contact sheets. There we go. Um, near the door, make sure you give us your contact information. Um, and at the welcome table on a lawn, you can pick up a red welcome bag. Um, we always put our faith into action here at All Saints Church, and that's actually kind of what we're talking about here today: is ways that we can put our faith into action. Uh, another way is by stopping by our action table. We always have an important thing to sign. Uh, this week, we invite you to sign a letter to your members of Congress in support of strengthening the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. Uh, there are proposed changes to these credits that are really amazing, that they would um, uh, bring two million children out of poverty and lessen the impact of poverty for nine million people. That's worth going to a table and signing a letter. So please do that uh, after, if you haven't already, um, excuse me, go to our action table, which is near the north door of the church. Um, it is your generosity and your love and the Holy Spirit's presence here that keep All Saints functioning. Uh, we are in the middle of our pledge campaign for 2020. Uh, if you have filled out your pledge for All Saints Church, thank you, thank you, thank you. It is wonderful. Um, we got a lot of pledges still outstanding, so if yours is one of them, uh, just ask you to do what you always do, which is say your prayers, uh, have the conversations that you make decisions about money with those people with, um, and pledge whatever put, uh, God puts on your heart. Uh, and it is all very needed, and it is all very appreciated. So thank you very much for your ongoing support of All Saints Church. And for those of you who are streaming, you can pledge too. There's a donate button there, and that'll take you to a page where you can make a special gift. You can pledge. We have lots of people pledging to All Saints Church who live out in other places in the country and even around the world. And it's a wonderful way of supporting the ministry of this place. So jump on in uh, and pledge too. I'm really thrilled this morning uh, to have Thomas, Ta whoop, did I just, whoop, there we go, to have um, Thomas Tig with us. I'm grateful to Jane Olson for making this connection for us. Um, Thomas, for the last 19 years, has served as the president and CS, uh, CEO of an organization, an really extraordinary organization called Direct Relief. Um, and it's a nonprofit humanitarian medical uh, organization. Uh, before that, he, from 1995 to 2000, he was the chief of staff and COO of the Peace Corps. Um, and so he has been involved around the world in deeply effective missions of humanitarian justice um, for really 25 years, and I imagine a long time before that. Um, and with the fires that are literally burning all around us, um, we are incredibly aware of the need of excellent humanitarian relief aid in times of disaster. Um, and so Thomas is here to share the story of direct relief uh, and to give us really an example of what our faith put into action is. Uh, and so I am not going to talk any more about Thomas. Instead, I'm going to invite uh, you up here and ask you to give uh, really a great All Saints welcome to Thomas Tighe. Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's really appreciate the, the kind introduction. And it reminds me, I did bring um, some of those N95 masks down for the church because I think they're 
we happen to have a large stockpile and they're a complete pain to get when you're informed that you need them from the wildfires. So we do, among other things, we stockpile. They're the particulate masks um, that filter out the fine particulate matter that when the wildfires break out, um, it's one of the things that kind of residents are urged to have. And when you're urged to have them, there's a rush on them and you can't find them. So I brought some down because I figure, if not now, soon, um, almost everywhere in the state. But it's one of the things that we, um, as you mentioned, are working today with the people in the state. And as I'll talk about, with the community health centers around California that serve people who are among the least fortunate and suffer disproportionately in situations of the type that we're experiencing now. But thank you, and thank you to, to Jane, uh, who's a member of Direct Release Board of Directors, and Ron uh, Olson, and Siri and Bob Marshall. Siri is also a member of the Direct Relief Board who are here today. It's a, it's a privilege for me to be here and talk in this beautiful uh, church in Sweetland Hall. And I know John Sweetland can't be here, but he's a member of our International Advisory Board. And uh, I know he recently completed a, a book that I have not read yet, but I will uh, pitch his book for you called Essay On, which is Let Us Try, the motto of the Army Corps of Engineers. So um, I think it, I haven't read it yet, but I'm sure it's excellent, just like the author is. Um, but Direct Relief, I think Direct Relief was started um, in 1948 by two war immigrant businessmen who had fled the Nazis. So they were, um, and ended up in all places of uh, Santa Barbara, California, with some of the wealth intact, but the fact that they were immigrant, refugees, and business folk, I think I mentioned that because I think it influenced how they looked at the world, how they looked at what became direct relief and the use of funds, and the engagement of private people in public benefit activities. Um, and I think they've been lost to history, our founders, but one of them had, was a high net worth, kind of a Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos of the time named William Zimden, who um, was recruited by Hitler. You know, the National Socialist Industrialist Party, the Nazis were, they were going after big prominent industrialists of which he was one. Um, he famously said publicly, about Hitler, what a pathetic little fool of a man is this trying to do it, which was a good call historically and put him immediately on the, the wrong side of uh, Adolf Hitler, which is why he ended up fleeing um, Europe, ending up in Santa Barbara. And when he passed away in 1951, uh, what had remained of his estate became the foundation of what's now direct relief. So, but. The fact that they weren't political, they were, uh, it was purely a humanitarian gesture by people who'd been successful in business. And although it, uh, at the time there wasn't a concept of corporate social responsibility, basically what the approach was in this bombed out post-war European situation was what we now think of as corporate social responsibility. He had done well in business, he had employees in a place that was bombed out and he was putting his own money um, to help them. But what kicked in was what he saw people in need of, um, he thought of the people who made it efficiently and at scale, and so he simply went to, to businesses and said, look, I'm putting my own money in to help these people. They don't have any money, but you know who, uh, what they need is what you make, and because you make it at such large scale, who better than you to participate you can do something really important um, by helping these people, and this is purely voluntary. And that idea of trying to engage the private industry or private parties for the public benefit um, was kind of a natural outgrowth of, I think, the circumstances. I never met him, but projecting back, and it's kind of an approach that Direct Relief still tries to employ today when we look at these humanitarian crises, whether it's here in California, here in Los Angeles, uh, in response to an emergency, or anywhere around the world, I think is a private nonprofit organization um, that doesn't have any religious affiliation and tries to remain apolitical. Uh, and really that is to invite the participation of everybody uh, in these causes that really serve all of us in society generally, and I think it came from 
uh, it, rather humble beginnings of people who fled the Nazis. And, you know, as we look at a world that is now confronted with more refugees than any time since that time, I think it's an interesting reminder for us at Direct Relief uh, what worked and what didn't, and how we might think anew about uh, how to engage and help those who need help while building structures for the future. So I think the, the mission um, is, as Mike said, it's, it's pretty simple, it's something we all learn in the second grade. It's not because of who they are, where they came from, it's help people who need help. Uh, we are all, as these, uh, severe emergencies remind us, we are all vulnerable uh, and one step away from potential crisis. And, uh, you know, some people are born into it, some people are thrust into it, but that sense of what constitutes a crisis and what happens and who you rely on. Um, we've had the great fortune of seeing, you know, these communities and people mobilizing to connect private resources for the public benefit now for 71 years as an organization, but certainly since I've been there since, uh, since late 2000. But the point of medical care is not to do medicine, the point of medical care is health, and the purpose of health is for all of us is to realize our inherent potential that we're all born with. Um, so I think we try to bear that in mind. I'll talk a little bit about the approach, uh, but I think in general, Nonprofits get into the weeds of their work and the functions they perform and often talk about money and fundraising, but at the end of the day, it's really, it's never, uh, it's a fairly simple mission. It hasn't changed at all. And I think it's one that is timeless, like the values that you were talking about that are represented here at All Saints Church. Um, you know, the, some of the, we've gone from the black and white era to the digital era, but I think just kind of the history of the organization was uh, from a business person's perspective, you need focus. And so they selected health as an organizing principle for direct relief. There's all sorts of issues uh, that, that need assistance in, uh, in areas of poverty or post-emergencies. And I think it's helpful to have an organizing principle and when the founders and direct relief locked on health as an organizing principle, that led to the kind of outreach to and invitation to those involved in healthcare uh, as a business or as a profession to invite them to participate in something that had no financial return but a very important uh, human cause related to it. I'm not sure, I think this was Ethiopia from the 70s where again, the, the, as you know here, the increasing speed and efficiency of the business community where you know they can anticipate what you want before you even know what you want if you're shopping online and now you can as Andrew McCollum my colleague said you can have a sofa delivered that same day if you wake up and think I want a cup of coffee and maybe a sofa you can have it within the same day so the the level of connectivity and speed and efficiency to connect commercially supply and demand, it's unbelievably advanced and getting better every day. By comparison, the level of connectivity for um, what's needed and what exists in a philanthropic sense and even in a government sense is light years behind by comparison. So I think philanthropically, I think what Direct Relief has always tried to do is what, are, what businesses are doing now to deliver goods and services they do only if there's a financial reason to do it. But if there's a financial reason to do it, they will compete like crazy, they will do it at light speed, they will, it's, you know, we've never had the ability to address services or the delivery of goods as well and quickly and develop and deliver as we do now. The dilemma of our times is, are we only gonna do that if there's a financial reason to do it? And clearly we know how to do it, but you see the dislocation in emergencies. We, we've been working extensively in Puerto Rico. If there's no financial driver, these tools that have been developed um, aren't applied. So you see kind of the, the cleavages in society, the division where people, if there's a reason to serve you financially, you will be very well served. If there's not a reason to serve you financially, you will be relatively less well-served going forward, and that's a tragedy. 
because we have more tools available now to address problems and solve them than ever before in human history. And if we choose only to apply them to those things for which there is a financial return or a large financial return, I don't think we've, um, I don't think the, the notion that we're evolving as a species to a better enlightened state uh, will be proven true. So I think we take some confidence. I think often there's a perceived distinction between, well, that's business and this is government and that's philanthropy or religion or the, the do-gooder causes. Why? You know, I, it's a completely false distinction. I think it's uh, something that should, if it's done well, it, you know, that old saying that, you know, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. That is particularly true when it's the right thing to do. So I think we look f with frustration when we see compelling need and inefficiencies to address that need, whether it's in Puerto Rico or California, and we don't necessarily expect that the, the public institutions are the only ones who should bear that responsibility. That's why you have a nonprofit sector. That's why uh, direct relief exists. We can help. I think much of, um, I think my colleague Andrew, the tall, younger, better looking and better spoken, sadly for me and you, um, colleague who's here today and runs our emergency and Heather Bennett, I think we were talking about this notion as Mike said, I came from government service, which when I was growing up meant public service. Public service kind of meant government service. I think it's been being redefined on the fly. The government's not inviting people to serve outside of a really, po in a political sense, but that notion of public service that was such a profound element of our society it has been redefined. Uh, we have 100 applications for any job and I often, these bright-eyed, switched-on young people, and I often ask, did you ever think of working for the government? And they laugh, it's like it never crossed their mind. So I think public service is increasingly being done privately. I think we see it expressed by the projection of desire to work for a nonprofit, whatever that means. I think it's, there's a lot of us that remain hardwired to serve, but the opportunities that exist that used to be kind of defined as government service are shrinking. And so there, what you see is kind of groups like Direct Relief, and I think even within the business community itself, uh, the desire for the people who work at companies to have the companies engage in a productive way. Ultimately, I think that's a good thing. And we as a group that does, I think, public service privately, tries to marry what's really good about the private sector, that speed and efficiency and hard-headedness when it comes to performing a function with the empathy and passion and collective good that defines public service. And there should be no distinction between, I mean, it's, it, it's a false distinction that we've kind of created, um, but one I think we have the privilege of seeing every day is Direct Relief has um, gotten to grow in increasingly by inviting the participation of people, not because they're required, it's voluntary, but because it strikes this a humanitarian impulse and we aim to do it well for anyone who supports it. And it's all privately funded, we don't receive a penny of government money. So what we do is an approach, I think, based in Santa Barbara, it's not a natural location to be the largest provider of charitable medications in the United States or the world. But I think, by both accounts, direct relief is. Um, but I think the idea is not to be a vertically integrated giant organization, it's to create connectivities to enable people who want to participate, companies that want to participate, particularly healthcare companies that make expensive products to sell, to make an opportunity for them to provide it charitably with confidence that it will serve the intended purpose. And to do that, we look for the locally run organizations that exist in most every community and try to plug in and make sure that they're connected to the resources that we can connect them to. So um, I think it'll get a little clearer if that's you know, confusing as I talked about it, but um, the networked approach to, with community health centers in California, throughout the United States, charitable hospitals around the world, to find them because we know if your mission is providing a free service, 
that's a really bad business model. You would have flunked out of business school. Like, I want to do something really hard and expensive for free. It's like, go to maybe, you know, um, Divinity College or something, but that is not a great business model, and it's not. But there's a lot of things that aren't a very good business case that are very powerful human cases that we all knew in the second grade. You know, uh, taking care of a kid with disabilities, it's not a good business model. They don't have any money. But it's one of the most profoundly important things we can do as people, and we know that. So when we do that, let's do it as well as it can be done as efficiently and try to apply and adapt some of these tools. And that's kind of the mindset to meld both the approach of business and delivering speed and efficiency with the heart uh, and passion and collective sense of public service that I think, and now I've so internalized it and the organization has, I don't see it as it white is so often perceived as either or when it can't be and won't work unless it's both. Um, functionally what we serve, I think sometimes there's a confusion between function and purpose, right? So I think if you say our purpose is humanitarian health, that sounds good. But the next question is like literally what do you do? <laughs> and then how well do you do that? Because if you kind of convince everyone of justice or something like that, a lot, anything that is done under the, uh, the guise of a righteous cause does not mean it's well done. And that's a People, at least people embittered, they hear something, whether it's education or environmental, and they see how it's actually pursued and what happens to the money, and they feel burned. So I think what we try to do is like, well, the, we know the cause is righteous, <laughs> but what functions are we performing? And so we've looked at um, what we're trying to do is basically a humanitarian supply chain that is as good as a commercial supply chain. I mean, Amazon kind of being the epitome of its swallowing every industry it looks at because it really is looking at how to connect, understand what people want, and deliver the goods and services um, as fast as possible at, at a good, uh, reasonable price. It doesn't matter, it's not specific to an industry, um, it's applicable to all. So I think that insight, I think in the many business people that we've had on our board who join the board for the cause also bring all this experience about what are we trying to do? If we're running a, which, which we are, a, basically a drug distribution company with warehousing and heavy compliance and cold chain, let's do it as well as it can be done. And for that, we've looked to business and um, it's really provided a huge leveraging factor to work alongside businesses who know how to do these types of functions well for their paying customers. And we've had conversations all the time to say, right where your market research, I mean, if you're in business, you don't go looking for people who can't buy your goods and services, right? So your market research is focused on who can buy what we're selling at a price that can be profitable for us. But by extension, right where you stop looking for people who can't pay, that's where we start. Our market research is not commercial market research, it's human demand. And you want to understand that so you can respond to it as well as possible. And that's what we're trying to do, so kind of a business-like approach to delivery of goods and services for people who cannot pay. And the business community understands that. And so do people who support us financially. It's not just the cause is important, so I'm giving money to the cause, I'm giving money to the cause that is having results associated with it. And I think that's the right balance that you need to address this, this seeping sense of skepticism that surrounds everything, uh, if not cynicism and to come at it um, as well and forcefully as we can, performing the functions that we perform well. I'll tell you, there's no such thing as nonprofit warehousing compared to like commercial warehousing. It's either good or bad, and we want to be good, so we, you go to Costco and you go to the groups that do it well and say, how would you do this? Or how do you do this? Help us. And they said, we would never do that. You're not, you're, there's no margin there. You're not going to make any money. And we said, exactly. <laughs> The people who know how to do it best aren't going to do it for the people who need it most, right? So that's the dilemma in society, the cleavage that gets deeper. When we know how to solve it, let's solve it for everybody. Um, it won't hurt your business because they're not buying anyway. Help us do it better to make stretch the dollars farther. So in the U.S., um, we thought, what would, you know, let's look at where the rubber hits the road. Where do people who are the least fortunate have their services? And it turns out there's about 12,000 sites around the country that are the point of entry to the health system for people who are 
low income, uninsured, undocumented. And there's there, uh, community health centers and free and charitable clinics typically run within a neighborhood or a region of underserved people. Our idea was let's network them all together and aggregate that demand so we can go to people who might be in a position to help and do it efficiently. Um, it took 10 years to do that. It was really easy to think that way, but uh, we ended up becoming licensed in all 50 states, the only nonprofit stupid enough to try that as a licensed pharmacy distributor, only to do it for free, um, but we wanted to do it for people we knew could get in and see a clinician and get a prescription that did them no good because they couldn't get it filled. 50, 10 years ago, 50% of the prescriptions being written to uninsured people were unfilled. So we thought, well, the businesses aren't losing a sale to provide that, uh, and the people get sicker, stay sicker longer, and die sooner, and this is in California. No one wants that, um, but it, it's more than a political situation. I mean, politics is important in public policy, but I think we looked at it and said, we can help. We've been here for 70 years. Let's lean into this a little bit, because we're sending um, help all over the world, but not all over the US. So we've seen, particularly uh, Hurricane Katrina, really exposed what's always been there, but people were shocked that this level of need existed in New Orleans. But that just exposed it, it didn't create it. And that's, we said, let's not do this again. That's why we got licensed in all 50 states, so we could respond efficiently to areas of need that are particularly, and people ask us all the time, are you an emergency group? Are you a development organization? And I thought, what's the difference? You know, for a lot of people, um, a good day is a near crisis, if not right on knife's edge. I mean, the homeless situation in Los Angeles is a perfect example. And the people who are most vulnerable in emergencies tend to be, or obviously are, the people who are most vulnerable the day before. So the idea is that if we can identify these institutions that serve people who are the least fortunate every day, that's the best place to plug in when something bad happens, which is what we did in Puerto Rico, I'll talk a little bit about. Um, but we've mapped out each one of these sites and tried to kind of connect them to us so we can see what they need, see the patterns that exist, apply the technology to kind of see where things like um, obesity or diabetes exist literally and spatially. When you hear these things, as I'm sure you do, America suffers from this rate of diabetes now and it's growing. You know, I read that and I thought, do we all have a little bit or is it all concentrated in like one state? You do different things if you know with the, with the information. And so trying to like put some detail behind this public information and being able to survey all of these different sites that serve people who are in the most severe need allows a picture to develop our market research of sorts that we can then go ask people, look, if you want to help address a crisis of diabetes that will ultimately kill people but certainly deprive them of a quality of life, here's literally where they are. We have no agenda, like, you know, come on in, we'll make it easy for you. And I think that's why we've been able to become the largest um, charitable medicines program in the United States, really connecting these people who serve the poor, that they don't have access to, um, they don't talk to big healthcare companies, there's 12,000 of them, they're really busy on a, um, but I think we've also used this network to, as the response to uh, emergencies, uh, including in Puerto Rico, where for 10 years prior to Hurricane Maria, we had been working with the com community health centers on the island for their low-income uninsured folks. So here comes Maria, it comes in and takes out the power grid, creates damage, it's a crisis, they lose all of their medical stocks, and we did what we always do, we thought, well, let's talk to the people we know who are in the poorest communities, serving people who are the most vulnerable, and ask them what they need and deliver. So. Um, as it turned out, that gave us focus and clarity, and because of the connections that Direct Relief has been fortunate to develop with FedEx, for example, um, which has been a fantastic partner for Direct Relief for years, we thought, look, can you help us with logistics? And they said, sure. So they offered charter planes, they offered their facility there, because we were actually able to get in touch. Andrew was down there for most of a year, and uh, 
really just get a picture of like, uh, what we could do with respect to health, where we could do it, the people we could work with, and literally what they needed, and to kind of activate that supply chain when there was no supply and lots of demand, you need to just have precision so you're not just throwing junk and creating a big cloggy mess, which often happens. So we were able to get down there, create the flow of material, for everything from insulin to vaccines to chronic medications, and it's now exceeded $100 million in support uh, to Puerto Rico that we've been able to do in the last two years. But this is really doing what we do every day at Direct Relief. And I think the distinction for us is not, whether it's an emergency or a crisis, it's basically you do more of what we do, you just do more of it faster. But it has to be done well, um, or it doesn't work. So it's been a real privilege for us to work in Puerto Rico, I think, to also see, interestingly, for, because of the fires, they were generating a lot of solar power in Puerto Rico that was going up to the power grid that broke. So despite generating a lot of solar power, it did zero good. So we realized that um, these facilities could not serve. They lost all their medication. So um, we worked with to develop solar generation and battery storage at the community health centers that serve you know, low-income communities. And we ended up becoming the largest installer of solar. This is a group that's like works in a warehouse in Goleta, right, doing medicine. And we ended up. Um, asking, what is it you need? And they said, we need power at our sites because we can't work. And we said, well, we don't do that. What else do you need? And they said, we need power to run our refrigerators so we can serve the poor. It's like, we don't do that. And after the third time, I thought, that is the worst answer. OK, let us work with you here. And um, we ended up getting the solar industry engaged. President Clinton came on board. So now there's better solar power and backup uh, storage in Puerto Rico than there is in California at community health centers, which is why in the last week and today we're announcing a million dollar commitment of cash um, from our current funds so that we can help community health centers throughout the state um, not lose their vaccines and um, insulin for their patients, because that's not a reimbursable loss for a power outage. So we think it's really important. Hospitals have to have three days of power in California. Health centers don't, aren't required to have any. And we have seen that play before in Puerto Rico. So those basic where the rubber hits the road, how to strengthen the institutions that serve the poor ultimately is how to make communities more resilient, um, you know, use money more wisely, and avoid known crises. Um, I returned from Mexico. We started Direct Relief Mexico. This, this week I returned, but we started it two years ago, basically so that we could help create the connectivity between the amazingly uh, extensive private resources Mexico with the vast poverty uh, that exists in a way that's not political, not, uh, not threatening, but we look at a, our southern border where we have been now a, a 501c3 equivalent trying to do exactly what we've done in California to connect the uh, private resources for the public benefit without any agenda we think there's a huge opportunity to do more of that. This is Azokolo, you know, the kind of the iconic institution, so direct relief from the uh, Mexican Association of Diabetes is working together. It's a huge uh, burden of disease for diabetes in Mexico. Prevention is essential to uh, avoid the type 2. And so they've never had the kind of outside support that we see as, you know, critically important and do all over the world. We're also working with the, uh, the cancer kind of the St. Jude's equivalent of uh, Mexico, you know, as for us working with healthcare companies, children's cancers are largely curable about 80% of the time if you get to care. If you don't, it's about 90% fatal. So I think trying to, again, in our southern border, making the connectivity of private resources to expand the capacity to take care of kids, and the, the, cost, or the, the cost of the drugs was the barrier so we've been able to kind of bring that cost down for free and enable uh, more children to enter uh, cancer treatment in Mexico. And in California, I think we've worked with um, community health centers now for the last 15 years. Um, 
on an ongoing basis. We work with the state carefully and really a backup to the state for emergencies and on an ongoing basis. So <clears throat> Butte County, uh, we were able to, we have stockpiles of medical essentials. So, uh, and we've responded to so many of these events that we can work with the county public health officers and model in these mass evacuations what we think is, uh, is going to be needed and, and then supply them that day. So we've remained very active up in, in Butte County, uh, in Sonoma County, um, Ventura County, Los Angeles County. And then this is something that we were cited last week that, um, you know, we, they thought, what's going to happen in California? And I thought our lens is disproportionate effects on the poor, and they're not ready. And we've seen it happen in Puerto Rico. So I think the nice thing is uh, Sacramento Bee wrote that. The governor made an announcement yesterday of, or Friday of a $75 million public commitment to help shore up some of these services. Um, and Direct Relief is, again, today making a million dollar commitment here at All Saints Church in Pasadena. So um, go team. Thank you <laughs> for giving me the opportunity. But really, we, we just want to make sure that people in this state uh, are as well protected as, as they should be. Um, we've worked to, we're actually manufacturing our own N95 masks. We happen to have the largest stockpile. I'm leaving some here at the church, so you won't have to go be disappointed when you try to order them online or at the store when the fire breaks out here, but we'll just be manufacturing our own. We'll have a few million arriving later, uh, early next month. So these will be distributed in event of fires free of charge to community groups. We work extensively to develop products for things like midwifery that are high value and important, and people who are doing midwifery in poor areas do not have access to these types of materials because their patients have no money, and it's a role that we feel that's important to play. Um, so I tried to condense 71 years of history and our cause into 30 minutes, and I apologize if I fumbled it massively, but I would like just to thank you again for kind of the leadership that All Saints Church and your parishioners have um, become famous for and giving me the opportunity to join you and talk a little bit about Direct Relief. You can always look at directrelief.org to see what we're up to and um, thank you very much. Um, so. thank you. On these community health service uh, that you mm -hmm. donate things to, how do you distinguish which ones you're going to give to versus others? I'm sure there's more that want this, these provisions than you have material to give to them. So how do you, for example, we, the Venice Family Clinic, okay? I don't know, maybe they don't require that kind of assistance versus other community health centers. I'm just trying to figure out how you distinguish which ones you're really going to help. Well, uh, I wish we, I could say we had a perfect algorithm to do that, and we don't. But I think we've worked with Venice ever since, actually we hired, our pharmacist started the pharmacy at Venice Family Clinic, and, um, but I think basically, all things being equal, the resources go to the poor area, because they inject, kind of, they, they're not, actually the same drugs are gonna help the same number of people wherever you send them, but we think collectively, if we can make investments in places that just do not have access to the philanthropic resources, it's a good thing. We're trying to create a, uh, a funnel, basically. We become a, we're not a grant-making organization typically, but we've become the largest financial supporter with cash assistance to the, um, the community health centers around the country, which is sad. I mean, this is where the rubber hits the road. They do very good work. They have standard data. They have heavy oversight because they receive Medicaid, and, um, but they're just off the grid. Um, but this is where 32 million people go, and they're, they could shrivel on the vine, and there's no backup plan uh, if that happens, but we do try to lean our discretionary resources into the areas of highest need, recognizing that if you have a thousand doses of insulin, they're gonna, it's gonna help the same number of people, so it's a bit of Sophie's choice, and it never feels good to deny someone, but we do, tie goes to the poor areas, basically. Yeah. Well, a microphone is finding someone. If someone in this room or online or a business they're associated with wanted to support direct relief, how would they do that? Well, thank you. First is 
uh, Mike said, support all saints. Um, and then if there's anything left, uh, go to directrelief.org. But I think, you know, we're, we're not great at soliciting. We're pretty good at briefing. Um, we, six months ago, we were approved as Google, a Google News source and an Apple News source. So we've, we're trying to communicate what we do and the facts in a journalistic way so people can make their own decision. Um, but please visit directrelief.org if you're interested. And of course, like anyone with a .org, they'd love support if possible. We don't presume to ask for it if, for people who don't know us. But thank you, Mike. Yes, sir. Thanks very much for this splendid presentation. I have never given to direct relief before, and I don't know many people who have, but after this one, um, I will join the team. And I say that as one who knows something about Church World Service and the Episcopal Relief Programs and CARE International and Oxfam and the NGOs around the world. So what I haven't heard is how you link up with these NGOs and others to separate yourself out in the dance of kind of which which ones uh, are being uh, not duplicated but encouraged. And I think I can per understand that your business plan uh, probably builds that in, but I'd like you to say a little bit about that kind of cooperation between uh, the great relief organizations that have existed. Right. And thank you very much for your great work. Thank you. Um, that's a good question. I think everyone uh, wants collaboration and, you know, we don't, there's plenty of work to go around. I think Direct Relief is so uniquely licensed. We're the only nonprofit that's licensed and accredited to handle prescription drugs in this country. And we think that's a very good thing internationally as well. There should be one standard, not a substandard for people who are poor. So we, everything Direct Relief does, I would not do it anywhere in the world unless I was confident my family could take it or myself. And so that is a, you know, so with respect to the handling of um, medications and cold chain medications, I think we're the only one who can do it to a level that we're doing it. So that avoids the competition. And many of the other groups focus on food, water, shelter. I mean, there's a, a number of basic sectors and we're right there in the health sector. Sometimes they bleed to, together um, for things like shelter, um, for temporary hospitals. I think there's shelter for temporary, you know, uh, housing. But we try to work very closely. We're part of the associations where you seek not to duplicate effort, and, which is unfair to everybody. Not, not only donors, more importantly, the people for whose benefit all this money is donated, they're ultimately the customers uh, and the people for whose benefit we're responsible for delivering the value. But thank you for a great question. Great. Question a second. We're going to say goodbye to everyone who's screaming with us because Keith has got to get over to the church and <laughs> service. But you've tried to ask a question.